Cranial Nerves Examination The mnemonic to remember cranial nerves is oh 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 to touch and feel very good velvet ah happiness so o for olfactory o for optic o for oculomotor t for trochlear t for trigeminal a for abducens f for facial v for vestibular cochlear g for glossopharyngeal v for vagus a for accessory and h for hypoglossal nerve so this is one way of how i remember the cranial nerves during the first year anatomy i think most of us have learned cranial nerves by remembering almost a similar mnemonic if you all know any other ways of remembering cranial nerves you all can share it in the comment section the first cranial nerve is the olfactory nerve initially you can show the items to the patient and ask the patient to sniff so that they recognize and they are aware of which items are going to be used now you ask the patient to close both the eyes one nostril is closed while the patient sniffs the item through the other nostril you can use coffee solution wicks orange peel clove oil or tea avoid irritants that stimulate the trigeminal nerve fibers in the nasal mucosa for example soap tobacco ammonia this procedure is supposed to be done for both the nostrils the second cranial nerve is the optic nerve under optic nerve we check for visual acuity color vision and reflexes under visual acuity snellen's chart is used for far vision and jager's chart is used for near vision color vision is checked using the ishihara's chart the most common color defect which is noticed is the red green deficiency under reflexes we have the direct reflex and the indirect reflex also called as the consensual light reflex under reflexes the first one is direct reflex the patient should look at a distant object to eliminate contraction of pupils on accommodation the opposite eye is to be closed bright light is focused into the other eye the response seen is constriction of pupil the second one is indirect reflex or the consensual light reflex place a cardboard or hand between both the eyes such that there is no eye closure focus the light in one eye this will cause constriction of pupils in both the eyes the third one under reflexes is accommodation reflex the patient is asked to look at a distant object the therapist's finger is gradually brought within 5 cm of the patient's eyes when the patient's gaze is directed from distant object to the therapist's finger this results in constriction of pupils few important viva questions over here the third and the fourth cranial nerve arise from the midbrain the fifth sixth seventh eighth cranial nerve from the pons the ninth tenth eleventh twelfth cranial nerve from the medulla oblongata the third fourth sixth eleventh and the twelfth cranial nerves are the pure motor ones the first second eighth cranial nerves are the pure sensory nerves and the fifth seventh ninth and the tenth cranial nerves are the mixed nerves also the second cranial nerve which is the optic nerve is the afferent nerve and the third cranial nerve which is the oculomotor nerve is the efferent nerve let's move further the third fourth and the sixth cranial nerves that is the oculomotor the trochlear and the abducens nerve these three are combined together because they help in eye movement the third cranial nerve which is the oculomotor nerve innervates the inferior oblique the medial rectus the inferior rectus and the superior rectus 
The fourth cranial nerve, which is the trochlear nerve, innervates the superior oblique. You can remember this as SO4. So SO for superior oblique, fourth for the fourth cranial nerve. And the abducens nerve innervates the lateral rectus muscle. As said earlier, remember that the third, fourth and the sixth cranial nerves are responsible for movement of the eyeball. The assessment for the third, fourth and the sixth cranial nerve includes pupillary reflex, which is the same as we have discussed for the optic nerve, and ocular movement. For ocular movement, the therapist stabilizes the patient's head and asks to follow an object held at arm's length. Move the object in six different directions of gaze. Observe the full range of horizontal and vertical eye movements. The six different directions include Ask the patient to look up and out, which is controlled by the superior rectus. Move the eye away from the opposite eye, which is controlled by the lateral rectus. Look down and out, controlled by inferior rectus. Look down and in by the superior oblique. Look towards the opposite eye, that is adduction done by the medial rectus. Look up and in by the inferior oblique. While performing this eye movement, you need to check for ptosis diplopia and nystagmus. Ptosis is drooping of eyelids. So if you see drooping of eyelids, it means that the levator palpebrae superioris muscle is affected. Diplopia means double vision. You need to ask the patient if the double vision is present in one or both the eyes. Nystagmus is rhythmic oscillation of eyes. Types of nystagmus includes vertical, horizontal and rotatory. The fifth cranial nerve is the trigeminal nerve. In order to check for the motor part, this includes the muscles of mastication. So the patient is asked to clench the teeth. On palpation, the masseters and the temporalis muscle becomes very prominent. You can also grade the muscles accordingly. Wherein, this is the grading of the facial muscles MMT. Grade 1 is functional. Grade 2 weak functional, grade 3 non functional, grade 4 poor. For the motor part of the trigeminal nerve, you can also ask the patient to open the mouth and check for deviation of the lower jaw. The jaw will deviate on the side of paralyzed lateral pterygoid muscle. For the sensory part of the trigeminal nerve, light touch is assessed by using cotton. Pain by pin prick and thermal by hot water in test tubes or cold water. With the patient's eyes closed, compare on both the sides in all the three divisions that is ophthalmic, maxillary and mandibular, V1, V2 and V3. If loss of sensations is seen in the onion skin distribution that is the lateral forehead, the cheek and the jaw, it means there is a brain stem or upper cervical cord lesion. Under reflexes, we have the corneal reflex, conjunctival reflex and the jaw jerk. For corneal reflex, touch the patient's cornea using a wet cotton wisp. For conjunctival reflex, touch the patient's conjunctiva using a wet cotton wisp. The response seen is bilateral blink in the eyes. For jaw jerk, ask the patient to open the mouth slightly and relax the jaw. The therapist places the finger on the chin and taps with the hammer. Slight jerk or a closure seen is considered to be a normal response. If there is increased jerk or jaw closure, it means there is a bilateral upper neuron lesion. Now as discussed earlier, the seventh cranial nerve, which is the facial nerve, is also a mixed nerve, just like the trigeminal nerve. So it is going to have motor as well as sensory function. Under the motor part, ask the patient to perform the following. Raising of eyebrows, done by the occipital frontalis. Eye opening by levator palpebrae superioris. 
frowning by corrugator supercilii, showing the upper teeth by the levator labii superioris, showing the lower teeth by the depressor labii inferioris, blowing out of cheek, buccinator, retraction of the chin, platysma. For the sensory part, four fundamental tastes should be tested on the anterior two-third of the patient's tongue, that is sweet, sour, salty and bitter, and the patient is asked to identify the same. The eighth cranial nerve is the vestibular cochlear nerve. It is a pure sensory nerve. To check the vestibular part, we'll use the dix Hallpike manure. The patient is in a sitting position with the arms folded. The patient's head is turned 45 degrees towards the side of the therapist. The patient is made to lie down with 20 degrees of neck extension and the patient's eyes are checked for nystagmus. First perform on the unaffected side and then on the affected side. For the cochlear part, start by whispering numbers or watch ticking or rubbing fingers in one ear while masking the other ear. If hearing is impaired, examine for wax or for infections. Deafness can either be conductive or it can be perceptive. In conductive, it includes or it involves the middle ear and in case of perceptive, it involves the nerve. The first test over here is the Weber's test. A vibrating tuning fork is placed against the vertex. Normally, there is equal hearing on both the sides. If there is a middle ear infection, the sound is louder in the affected ear. In case of nerve defect or nerve deafness, the sound is louder in the normal ear. For the rinse test, a vibrating tuning fork is placed over the mastoid bone. This is for bone conduction. Ask the patient if the note is heard. Once the note disappears, the tuning fork is placed in front of the ear for air conduction. Normally, air conduction is heard better as compared to bone conduction. But in case of middle ear infection, bone conduction is heard better as compared to air conduction. And in case of nerve deafness, air or bone conduction both are depressed. The ninth cranial nerve is the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is also a mixed nerve. So here, you can use sugar or salt solution over the posterior one-third of the tongue. Secondly, depress the posterior wall of the pharynx using a cotton swab until the patient gags. This is to check for gag reflex. Usually, the ninth and the tenth cranial nerve, which is the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerve, are clubbed together. The 10th cranial nerve is the vagus nerve. The patient is asked to open the mouth with the tongue protruded and said to say ah. Check for position of the uvula, check for hoarseness of voice, nasal twang and check for gag reflex. The 11th cranial nerve is the accessory nerve wherein we are going to test for the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid muscle. For the trapezius, ask the patient to shrug his or her shoulder against downward resistance. And for sternocleidomastoid muscle, ask the patient to rotate the head against the resistance. Lastly, the twelfth cranial nerve is the hypoglossal nerve. Ask the patient to open the mouth and inspect the tongue. Check for tongue muscle atrophy. That is, if there are increased folds or if there is muscle wasting. Check for tongue fibrillations, that is small wriggling movements. Give resistance to the tongue movements inside both the cheeks from outside.